Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about CDL air brakes in the state of California. Had a request from Jose Ande that he wanted me to go over the manual in the similar fashion that I had done for New York State. Jose Ande was working towards his CDL license and wanted some more information about the air brake portion of it. And I do apologize if Jose Ande is a woman because Oziande can be either female or male. Today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the manual for the state of California for CDL air brakes, which is chapter five, and go into the trailer section, which is in chapter six, and go over that and give you some more clarification and some more information about air brakes. Just as a note, students find air brakes challenging, and there's no doubt that air brakes are challenging. It's a technical course, there's lots of terminology that you have to learn, and some of the terminology you have to learn, it's only for the purposes of the license, because California, New York State, and all the provinces in Canada are still teaching a 40-year-old air brake course. So unfortunately, there's some stuff that you just have to learn for the purposes of the license, a wig wag, for example. Wig wags haven't been on trucks or buses since the 1980s. Everything now for low air warning devices is a light and buzzer. So be right back to talk to you about CDL air brakes in the state of California. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about CDL air brakes in the state of California. This is gonna be a four video series. The three sections in chapter five of the California CDL manual will be three separate videos and then I'll go into the trailering on chapter six and talk to you about trailers. Air brakes have been fitted on large commercial vehicles since the 1920s. They were first on trains in the 1800s to stop them and during that period of time, almost a century now that they've been on trucks and other commercial vehicles, they have proven reliable. Second, air brakes are able to transmit large, powerful forces, braking forces over long distances. Think of a semi-truck, for example, the driver sitting at the front of the truck and the trailer brakes are able to be put on 75 feet away. So large distances are able to be covered with air brakes. Finally, air brakes are tolerant to significant leaks in the system and will continue to operate normally, unlike hydraulic brakes. You get a leak in a hydraulic brake fluid, those brakes are not going to work. Fortunately, there are fail safes in place, both for hydraulic brakes and air brakes that will allow them to work properly or at least work and allow the driver to bring the vehicle to a complete stop safely and efficiently. So both air brakes and hydraulic brakes have a fail safe in them and we'll talk about that in greater detail later in the video. No doubt air brake courses are technical and difficult to understand because of the terminology that goes along with air brakes makes it difficult. We talk about service brakes, parking brakes, and emergency brakes on an air brake equipped vehicle. That for some can cause confusion. Now, the way to think about it is, is that the brakes on an air brake equipped vehicle are no different than the brakes on a car or light truck, the car or light truck that you have parked in your driveway and you drive every day. The brakes on an air brake equipped vehicle are exactly the same. On your vehicle, when you go up and down the road, you push down on the brake pedal, which are essentially the service brakes. The vehicle comes to a stop and the brakes release when you take your foot off the pedal. It's essentially powered by hydraulic fluid. The brake pedal is attached to the master cylinder, which is essentially a pump. You push down on the pedal and create pressure and the brakes apply and it comes to a stop. When you park the vehicle, for those that use the parking brake, when you park the vehicle, you apply the parking brake. The same thing on an air brake equipped vehicle. You simply pull the buttons out on the dash on a large commercial truck. Some buses you have to push it in. It's reverse, but if you're driving a transit bus, you'll know that. However, for the purposes of this, we're gonna pull them out, evacuate the air from the system. The large powerful springs expand and apply the brakes and the vehicle is left parked indefinitely. On your vehicle, it's a handle, either with your hand or with your foot. You push down on it, it's a ratchet system that locks into place and it is connected to the rear brakes but via a cable. The vehicle has its brakes applied and the vehicle is secured against movement indefinitely. If you're going up and down the road and you're unfortunate enough you lose your brakes, you can use that lever and pull up on it and use it as an emergency brake. Essentially what you're doing is taking the parking brake and applying the brakes using that for an emergency. Air brakes are exactly the same. In the event of a catastrophic air loss in the vehicle, you'll lose enough air that those powerful springs will expand 
and the spring brakes will come on and we call them the emergency brakes. So the only difference between air brakes and the brakes that you find on your car or light truck is the power source. For the service brakes on your car or light truck, it's hydraulic power or hydraulic force. You push down on the brake pedal, activate the pump, and you apply the brakes. On a big truck, it's air. The parking brake, it's simply mechanical power that comes out of you. You pull that ratchet up, click, 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 and it locks into place. On a big truck, it's the large, powerful springs. Same thing on your car. To use that parking brake as an emergency brake, you simply pull it up using mechanical force. And on a large commercial vehicle, those large, powerful springs that are usually used and best used for parking are also the emergency brakes. In the state of California, when you show up for your road test, you have to bring a vehicle that is equipped with air brakes. And in the state of California, they designate air brakes as the vehicle having a low air warning device and having air gauges. If it doesn't have those two components, then you will have a restriction on your license. The restriction on your license will say no air brakes and you won't be able to operate a commercial vehicle that has air brakes. And in this day and age, it's gonna to be tough to find a commercial vehicle that doesn't have air brakes. So you're gonna need air brakes in your bid to get a job. Make sure you get your air brakes, make sure you bring the correct vehicle to your road test. Must have a low air warning device, must have air gauges. The air compressor on a large commercial vehicle is exactly the same as one you would find in a shop or garage. It pumps air into the tank when the tank pressure reaches a maximum, the air compressor shuts off. When it goes to a minimum, the air compressor comes back on and fills the tank up to maximum. On a large commercial vehicle, the air compressor is either belt driven or gear driven. They're not belt driven anymore. They haven't been belt driven since the 1970s. They're all bolted right to the side of the motor and they're gear driven. For the purposes of license, you have to know they're belt driven. And if it is belt driven, the way you check the tension on the belt is the midpoint between the two pulleys push down the belt should not go more than its own width. As well, the air compressor uses the engine's lubrication system. Sometimes it's cooling system, but I've never seen one that uses the engine's cooling system. Most of them are air cooled. As well, it draws air in from the engine's main filtration system. So the air compressor is truly parasitic. If it does have its own lubrication system, which most likely it will not, you need to check it as part of your pre-trip inspection. The difference between an air compressor in a shop and the one on your commercial vehicle is that the compressor runs the entire time that the engine is on, so we need some way to control it. We control the compressor with the governor, and the governor puts it into the cut-in phase or the cut-out phase. In the cut-out phase, the compressor is pumping air into the atmosphere, and the cut-in phase is pumping air into the system. And the maximum pressure of the system is around 125 pounds per square inch, which is the cutout phase, and the cut-in phase when it pumps air into the system is approximately 100 pounds. So when the system goes down to approximately 100 pounds, the governor will put the compressor into the cut-in phase. There's a complete video on the governor. You can find that here. Check out that for the complete details on the governor. The air tanks, sometimes called reservoirs, store compressed air. The air tanks are the first failsafe in an air brake system. If the compressor stops working or some reason falls off the side of the engine, the air tanks hold enough air for 10 to 12 full brake applications. On older systems, there will be three tanks, the wet tank, the primary tank, and the secondary tank. On newer systems, the ADIS systems, air dryer integrated systems, there'll only be two tanks, the primary and secondary tank. And how you know it's an ADIS system is because the governor will be located within close proximity to the air dryer. Air dryers have proven really good at ridding compressed air of water and other contaminants. Therefore, the air dryer has made the wet tank redundant and no longer needed on these systems. Air tank drains. Most of the air tank drains on trucks are going to be manual. If you get low clearance vehicles, buses and RVs and whatnot, they may be automatics, but for the most part, they're manual. Question on the test is how often do you drain air tanks? Daily, 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 every day. That'll be the question on the test. The reason for that is, is that water and other contaminants collect in the tanks and you have to get rid of that. If there's water in the tanks, it could potentially freeze and cause failure of the air brake systems, especially if you're working in colder climates. 
not so much California, but if you're working in Alaska, that is definitely a risk that the water could freeze inside the air brake system and potentially cause it to fail. So daily, daily, daily drain the air tanks on the system. Uh, the drains on the tanks can either be one of two types, a stopcock, which is just a tap that you open and allow the tank to drain. Most of them on big trucks have pull cords and you pull the cord and hold it until the tank drains completely. It's not likely you're gonna find an alcohol evaporator on an air brake equipped vehicle in the state of California, maybe in Duluth, Minnesota, maybe in Alaska, but for the most part, you're not gonna find them on vehicles in California. However, the alcohol evaporator introduces methyl hydrate into the system and lowers the freezing point of water, so therefore there's less risk of it freezing inside the system. Question on the test is, what kind of methyl hydrate do you put into the alcohol evaporator? manufactured approved methyl hydrate. If you want to think of another analogy, the reason they put salt on the roads in the winter time is to lower the freezing point of water and this only works down to about minus eight. So methyl hydrate inside an alcohol evaporator works about the same. But like I said, in the state of California, you're not gonna to have to worry about one. And the answer to the question on the test is manufactured approved methyl hydrate is what you use to refill the alcohol evaporator. All tanks that are pressurized have a safety valve on them. In the event that the pressure gets too high and potentially could cause damage to the vehicle or danger to people in and around the vehicle, the safety valve will let off the excess pressure. On an air brake equipped vehicle, it's set for 150 pounds per square inch, and you'll know it's the safety valve and that you have excess pressure in the system because it makes a very distinct sound, the sound of a machine gun. If you hear that sound, you look down at the air gauge and note that it's around 150 pounds, which is too high for an air brake system because most of them run at 125 at a maximum of 135. So you'll see that it's 150 pounds. When that happens, take it to a mechanic and say authoritatively that the governor has failed, maybe the compressor, but for the most part, it's usually the governor. Safety valve, 150 pounds per square inch. The brake pedal controls the service brakes. It can also be called the foot valve or the treadle valve, but for our purposes, we're gonna call it the brake pedal. The brake pedal controls the service brakes. You go up and down the road, you push down on the brake pedal, it applies the brakes. The harder you push, the harder the brakes apply. There is, on a large commercial vehicle that has air brakes on it, a delay from the time that you put your foot on the brake pedal to the time that the brakes apply, and conversely, when you release the brake to the time that the brakes release. That is called brake lag, and it's a term that you will need to know for the purposes of a license. It's a very slight delay. It's about less than half a second, but there is uh, brake lag in an air brake equipped vehicle. As well, when you release the service brakes on a large commercial vehicle, the air that you use to apply the brakes is exhausted into the atmosphere. So if you pump those brakes, you're gonna lower the air pressure in the system and if you pump them hard enough, if you fan them down or pump them hard enough, eventually what you're gonna do is lower the air pressure in the system and it could get dangerously low, which you'll know because the low air warning will come on and your brakes won't work. So in a large commercial vehicle, especially if you're going downhill or doing hard braking, don't hold the brakes and then release them, release and apply, release and apply. Hold the brakes down so that you have constant pressure going to the brake chambers. That way you're not gonna lower the air pressure inside the system. So don't pump the brakes on a large commercial vehicle. The foundation brakes. The foundation brakes are the components of the air brake system that actually bring the vehicle to a stop. The brake drums, the linings, and the shoes are all located on the axle and the tire and rim are mounted onto the drum. Inside the drum is the brake shoes and linings and when you activate the brakes or push down on the brake pedal, the shoes are forced out against the drum, create friction and slow the vehicle and the tires. And if you have traction with the road, the vehicle will come to a stop. At least that's the hope and dream. Anyway, the most common types of foundation brakes are S-cam brakes, wedge brakes, and disc brakes. Probably in this day and age, you're not gonna find wedge brakes. Question on the test for wedge brakes is how many brake chambers will wedge brakes have? May have one or two is the answer to the question on the test. Disc brakes are beginning to make inroads into the commercial driving industry. And the reason for that is because disc brakes don't experience brake fade. And if you want the complete video on brake fade, you can find that here. I'll put a card up here for you for the complete video on brake fade. S-cam brakes do experience brake fade. There's heat generated from the friction because you convert forward motion of the vehicle into heat energy. 
that heat is dissipated into the atmosphere via the drum and to some extent the rim. But if you put too much heat to the drum and rim, eventually what's gonna happen is it's gonna catch fire and you're gonna experience brake fade because it expands, moves away from the brake shoes and the brake shoes will no longer come in contact with the drum. So brake fade is another term that you need to know for the purposes of your CDL license test. And brake fade, not only for air brakes, but any braking system is the one and only weakness that is left and driver air will cause brake fade so there's no reason to experience brake fade as well downhill braking you need to know how to do that correctly there's a downhill braking video i'll put up a, a card here for you for the complete video on downhill braking so you don't experience brake fade S-cam brakes are the most common type of foundation brakes, mostly found on semi-trucks and buses as well. On a lot of newer buses, you're gonna find disc brakes, but the S-cam, as you can see here in the image, consists of the brake chamber, the push rod, the slack adjuster. All slack adjusters are automatic. Unlike this image, it's a manual slack adjuster. The S-cam, and the S-cam goes into the brake shoes and forces the brake shoes out against the drum and you can see that there's an S on the end of the S cam, thus it's called the S cam because it's shaped like an S, and it basically rotates when you apply the brakes and forces the shoes out against the drum, it creates friction and brings the vehicle to a stop. The other type of brakes is cam lasters and the difference between cam lasters and common S type foundation brakes is that cam lasters are self-adjusting and they also apply the brake shoes against the drum evenly. So on an S-cam, it forces the top out and essentially there's a bit of a lever there so the brakes don't wear evenly. On a cam laster, there's some sort of slide incline inside of the brake mechanism which evenly pushes the shoes out against the drum. So the cam laster is another type of foundation brake that has advantages over the S-cam type foundation brake. The other type of foundation brake is disc brakes and disc brakes are beginning to make inroads into the commercial industry. The reason for that is because disc brakes don't experience brake fade and you'll find disc brakes on most cars and light trucks now, especially on high-end sports cars and motorcycles and the reason for that is because when you heat up disc brakes, they actually work better than conventional drum brakes. And the reason for that is, is because when you heat up the rotor, the plate in the middle, it actually expands into the brake pads. So when you heat them up, disc brakes become more aggressive. The problem on large commercial vehicles is that there's too much heat generated. And when you have too much heat generated inside the disc brakes, the whole assembly kind of melts into a pile of goo and your vehicle careens down the road and crashes into a tree and you die in a fiery inferno. So they're coming. Not quite there yet because the materials aren't there to absorb the sheer amount of heat that is generated on large commercial vehicles, but you'll see in the next 10 years that disc brakes will become prolific within the commercial driving industry. Supply pressure gauges. All air brake systems will have pressure gauges to tell you how much air pressure is in the system. Air pressure gauges, there will be two pressure gauges inside the system because there's a primary and a secondary system. There haven't been single circuit systems since the 1970s. So all systems are gonna be a primary and a secondary system and you'll either have two gauges, one for the primary system and one for the secondary system, or you'll have one gauge with two needles and one will be green and one will be red, signifying the, the pressure in the primary and secondary system. You need to operate the system above 100 pounds per square inch and also need to monitor maximum and minimum pressures as the system's going up and down to note that in fact the governor is working and putting the compressor into the cut-in phase or the cut-out phase. Application pressure gauge tells you how much pressure you're putting to the service brakes when you push down on the brake pedal. In the manual it says that the harder you push down on the brake pedal if you're going down and the brakes aren't applying any harder may indicate that you are experiencing brake fade or other mechanical problems, perhaps an air leak in the system and whatnot. Uh, that's not necessarily true. However, if you are pushing harder down on the brake pedal and the brakes don't seem to be braking any harder, and you are going down a hill and using the brakes excessively could indicate that you have brake fade. However, application pressure gauge is really good for training students in terms of air brakes and pre-trip inspection for the purposes of a license, but going up and down the road, let's really hope that you're not looking at the application pressure gauge while you're going up and down the road. Most normal brake applications are gonna be made at less than 10 pounds per square inch. If you're making a harder brake application than 10 pounds per square inch, 
there could be something wrong with the air brake system, but for the most part, it's not. Application pressure gauge tells you how much pressure you're putting to the service brakes. Low pressure warning device is a buzzer and a light on all modern vehicles. On some old vehicles, you may find a wigwag, which is essentially this little arm that drops down in front of your face when pressure drops below 55 pounds per square inch. Wigwags haven't been on vehicles since the 1980s. What happened was is that the pressure dropped in the system a couple of times and this thing dropped down in front of drivers, scared the living daylights out of them. They <laughs> drove off the road, crashed into a tree and died in a fighter inferno and the engineers went, uh, you know, maybe that's not such a great idea. Let's just go with a light and a buzzer. So light and a buzzer in the state of California must come on above 55 pounds per square inch. On a lot of vehicles, it's gonna come on well above 55 pounds. As it says in the manual, on a lot of buses, it's gonna come on between 80 and 85. A lot of trucks, it'll do the same thing as well. Low air warning, all vehicles are equipped with low air warning and on modern vehicles, they're gonna be a light and a buzzer. Stoplight switch simply means that when you push down on the brake pedal, the brake lights are gonna come on. As part of your pre-trip inspection, you need to check the brake lights on a commercial vehicle when you're doing your license and every day as part of your pre-trip inspection. Stop light switch, the brake lights come on when you push down on the brake pedal. Front brake limiting valves. All vehicles are equipped with automatic front wheel limiting valves and on newer vehicles, you're not even gonna know that they're there. However, if you make a hard brake application over 60 pounds, <laughs> let's hope that if you make a 60 pound brake application on an air brake system, you got your seat belt on because you make a 60 pound brake application, you are going to be doing a bug impression on the inside of the windshield. Let me tell you, that vehicle is going to come to a hard, hard stop. As I said, most normal braking is done at less than 10 pounds per square inch on a vehicle equipped with air brakes. Automatic front wheel limiting valves reduce braking to the front axles by 50% for most normal braking because Steer axles are used for steering, not used for braking. However, over 60 pounds, as it says in the manual, it's gonna come on equal as the rear brakes, but that's a really hard brake application. On older vehicles, if you're driving something 1970, it's gonna be a manual switch. It's gonna be on the dash, as you can see here in the image, slippery drive. Most driving is gonna be in the dry position. If it is raining or you're on snow and ice, you can put it into the slippery position to reduce braking to the front axles by 50%. Spring brakes, prior to the advent of spring brakes, a few semi-traders got pushed over a hill and killed a porta potty and engineers and other officials thought, you know, maybe we need some way of applying the brakes indefinitely. So they came up with large, powerful springs to apply the brakes mechanically. Therefore, the brakes were applied indefinitely while left parked. These large, powerful springs inside of the spring brake chamber are piggybacked onto the service brake chamber. They're almost always on the rear of vehicles because they also work as emergency brakes because the springs are held in the caged or off position with air pressure. If the air pressure drops too low, between 20 and 45 pounds, the springs will activate automatically, expand and apply the brakes and we like to have the steer tires for steering, so spring brakes are not on the steer tires, the steer axles rather, rather they're on the back of the vehicle. So they're used for parking most of the time, and they're also used for emergency brakes in the event that the air pressure drops too low. And again, as it says in the manual, as soon as that low air pressure warning comes on, you better be looking for a safe place to get that vehicle off the road and determine why you have an air leak. Also, the question on the test is, if the service brakes are out of adjustment, the parking brakes are also out of adjustment. So if the parking brakes are not working properly, your service brakes are not gonna be working as well. So you need to get them adjusted up. That's the question on the test. If the service brakes are out of adjustment, so too are the parking brakes and the emergency brakes. Parking brake controls is a four-sided yellow button on the dash. Push it in to put air into the spring brake chamber and cage the spring. This releases the parking brakes, pull it back out, it exhausts the air from the spring brake chamber and the spring expands and applies the parking brakes. Also, if you lose air in the system, the spring will expand and apply the parking brakes as an emergency brake. In the manual, it says not to compound the brakes. 
That's what it's called when you have the parking brakes on and make a service brake application. All modern vehicles are equipped with an anti-compounding valve, so you can't apply the service brakes when the parking brakes are on. It just exhausts the air into the atmosphere rather than putting it into the service brake chamber. When you compound the brakes, you're making a service brake application, plus the pressure from the spring brakes could potentially damage the components inside the system. So that's what they're talking about uh, when you apply the service brakes and the parking brakes at the same time, compounding the brakes. Modulating control valves. Never seen a system that has a modulating control valve. They're out there somewhere, they're in the manual. It allows you to apply and release the spring brakes in a similar manner that you would do with the service brakes. If your vehicle is equipped with that, there's a lever and there's a locking mechanism on the lever so that the parking brakes can be held on, but modulating control valve allows the spring brakes to be applied and released in the same way that you would with service brakes. Dual parking control valves. What they're talking about there is a separate air tank to release the spring brakes in the event that you weren't paying attention, <laughs> i.e. sleeping, which you really shouldn't be doing while you're driving. Anyway, the spring brakes applied and the vehicle is stuck somewhere that is not desirable. There's a separate air tank and there's a dead man switch on the dash. It, dead man switch means that you gotta hold it down in order to put air into the spring brake chamber and release the spring brakes. There's a limited amount of air, so use it wisely to release the spring brakes and move the vehicle to a safe location as quickly as possible. Again, I've never seen this on an air brake system so it's unlikely that you're going to encounter it. Most of these vehicles are gonna have a four-sided yellow button on the dash to activate and release the parking brakes. And if you're driving a semi-truck, there will be an eight-sided red octagon button that activates and releases the parking brakes on the semi-trailer. So again, it's a dead man switch, extra air tank to release the spring brakes in the event that you weren't paying attention and the spring brakes activated in the event of a catastrophic air loss. All modern vehicles have ABS brakes and the way that you know that the truck or bus has ABS brakes when you turn the key to the on position and wait momentarily, the ABS light will come on on the dash. It's usually orange. It will come on momentarily and then go off. That means that your ABS is working normally. If you're not sure that you have ABS on your truck or trailer, the way that you can tell is you go out to the unit, go out to the brake chamber, the air line that's running out to the brake chamber will have an electrical line zippy tied to it and that's the way that you know you have ABS brakes on your vehicle. The way that you brake with an ABS system, you brake normally and in normal situations it's just going to have normal brakes on it. In hard emergency braking situations it's different than normal brakes because what you do is you hold down on the brake pedal and hold hard and look in the direction that you want to steer. Essentially ABS brakes stop the wheels from locking up because when the wheels lock up you lose steering and lose control of the vehicle. So you hold the brakes down hard, shutter, noise, pushback, all of this is normal in an ABS equipped vehicle. On older vehicles, the ABS light on the dash may not go out until you attain five miles per hour. After you attain five miles an hour, the ABS light will go out. On trailers, oftentimes the ABS light is near the rear of the trailer on the driver's side and you can usually see it in the driver's mirror. One of the things to keep in mind about ABS brakes is that ABS brakes will not stop you in a shorter distance. ABS brakes are designed for you to keep control and to keep steering in the event of an emergency situation. So in an emergency situation, hold the brake down, hold it down hard. You may have to post off the steering wheel and look in the direction that you want to go. That way the front wheels won't lock up. Another component on your air brake equipped vehicle might be ATC, automatic traction control. Automatic traction control diverts power from a spinning wheel to another wheel on the rear axle so that you can regain traction. In some cases, it'll actually cut power to the motor, ATC. It uses all of the same components as the ABS, but simply tries to regain traction, usually when you're on slippery conditions and parking lots and that sort of thing in the wintertime or in mud conditions where traction is compromised. So ATC uses the components of the ABS system and piggybacks on that. The other thing to keep in mind is if you've got a combination vehicle, truck and trailer, where one unit has ABS and the other unit doesn't. This is particularly with trucks will have ABS and the trailer won't. So if you're in an emergency situation with a truck and trailer, just keep an eye in the mirror because you may be braking with ABS on the truck, but the trailer is actually normal brakes. And if you're 
pushing down hard on the brake pedal, the trailer brakes are actually locked up. Make sure you're having a look in the mirror there because if the trailer starts coming around, you're gonna have to release the brakes to try and get that unit straightened out. Anti-lock braking systems are designed for you to keep control of the vehicle and to keep steering. As I tell students all the time, the reason that we lose control of the vehicle is because of over braking, over steering, and over acceleration. Any one of those will cause the wheels to lock up or to spin, and a spinning or locked wheel always leads, which means that the back end is going to come around or the front end is going to kick out. So overuse of the primary controls is going to cause you to lose control, and an attractor trader unit could potentially cause you to jack knife. So keep your eye on the mirror, use the ABS correctly. Review questions. Turn the video off, answer the questions, come back, and we'll go over the review questions together. First question, why must air tanks be drained? Air tanks must be drained to rid the system of water and other contaminants in the system. Water in the system could potentially freeze if it's cold and cause the system to fail. Question on the test is how often do you drain air tanks? Daily, 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 every day drain the air tanks. What is the supply pressure gauge used for? The supply pressure gauge is to tell you how much pressure is in the system. Question on the test, what do the supply pressure gauges tell you? They tell you how much pressure you have available for a service brake application. For example, if you have 40 pounds in the tank, the maximum brake application you can make is 40 pounds. If you have 100 pounds in the tank, the maximum brake application you can make is 100 pounds. Next question, all vehicles with air brakes are equipped with a low air warning device. True, all air brake equipped vehicles must have a low air warning device and it will either be a wigwag or a light and a buzzer. In the old days, they were a wigwag Wigwags haven't been on since the 1980s. It must come on above 55 pounds per square inch. If it is a wigwag and it does come on, in order to reset it, once the system pressure goes above 55, you just push it back up above the visor there and it'll stay up. What are spring brakes? Spring brakes on large commercial vehicles equipped with air brakes are used for the purposes of parking and emergency brakes. When you're going up and down the road, these large powerful springs are held in the release or cage position by air pressure. If you lose air pressure in the system, the springs will expand, apply the brakes, and work as an emergency system to apply the brakes and bring the vehicle to a stop. When you park, you pull the four-sided yellow button out on the dash, exhaust the air from the spring brake chamber, the spring expands and applies the parking brakes. The spring brakes are best used for parking. That's the question on the test. Front wheel brakes are good under all conditions. The answer, oddly enough, is true. Despite what, what technology is applied to the front steer axles to prevent lockup, ABS brakes, front wheel limiting valves, and the fact that there aren't spring brakes on the front steer axle, all of that would lead you to believe that a front wheel lockup is dangerous when in fact, uh, skid pad tests have shown that rear wheel lockup is actually much more dangerous for the driver than steer axle lockup. So therefore, front wheel brakes are actually good because as we know on cars and light trucks and other vehicles, the front brakes actually do most of the braking. They do 60 to 75, maybe even 80% of braking in really hard braking situations. And if you got the question wrong, <laughs> I too initially got the question wrong. And I would like to thank DC Fitness for pointing that out so that I could make amendments and bring you the best information possible. So front brakes, are good under all conditions? The answer is true, but if you're driving a truck that has a manual front wheel limiting valve and it's slippery out, you can put it into the slippery position. Most of the front wheel limiting valves are automatic and most of the time you're not even gonna know they're there. However, in a hard, 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 super hard brake application, more than 60 pounds, you're gonna have equal braking to the front steer axles as you will to the back. So, front wheel brakes are good under all conditions, true. And how do you know if your vehicle is equipped with anti-lock brakes? You know that it's equipped with anti-lock brakes because you turn the key to the on position, the orange ABS light on the dash will come on momentarily and then go out. If it's an older vehicle equipped with ABS brakes, after you attain five miles per hour, the light will go out. If the trailer has ABS brakes down the side of the trailer, there will be a light on the driver's side near the rear of the trailer, which you can see in the driver's mirror. If you're not sure, go out to the brake chamber, the airline running to the brake chambers will have an electrical line zippy tied to it. That's the other way that you can know that you have ABS brakes. 
So in this video, we've gone over section one of the CDL air brake manual for the state of California. I'll put a card up here for you for the second video for section five, two of the air brake manual. I'll go over that. Section one essentially covered the parts of an air brake system, the air compressor, the governor, the air gauges, application pressure gauges, spring brakes, most common types of foundation brakes, S-cam brakes, cam lasters, wedge brakes, disc brakes, and those types of components as well. We went over ABS brakes and whatnot. This was section one of the CDL manual for the state of California. Section two is available and the rest of it as well as chapter six, which goes over semi trailers. Question for my smart drivers, which part of the air brake course have you found the most challenging? Is it the terminology, the parts of the air brake system, or is it the numbers that you need to know for the purposes of doing your pre-trip inspection for getting your air brake uh, ticket as part and parcel of your CDL license? Leave a comment down in the comment section there. All of that helps out the new drivers working towards getting their air brakes and their commercial license. I'm Rick with Smart Drive Test. Thanks very much for watching. If you like what you see here, share, subscribe, leave a comment down in the comment section as well. Hit that thumbs up button. Check out all the videos here on the channel if you're working towards a license or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. Lots of great information here as well. Head over to my website, lots of great information over there and online courses that you can purchase. Stick around to the end of the video, funny bits and links to the other videos and the great information that you can find both here and on my website. Thanks again for watching. Good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now. And yes, I had to redo this goofy video because I made a mistake in the video and the information was not correct for those of you watching the video. Thus, we're redoing it and making amendments in the information we're presenting to you.